So again, this is Northern Renaissance Art. It's hosted by me, Chris Clancy, former AP Euro and AP Psych teacher and an AP reader. Uh, and I am joining you from New Zealand. Make sure that you follow Think Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, as well as on YouTube. So you can stay up to date on all of the casts and reviews that we are doing. Some upcoming in this, we are gonna review Italian Renaissance art. And then I'm gonna show you the qualities of Northern Renaissance art and then show you some masters and then go through the differences from Italian Renaissance art. Uh, again, you do have access to this PowerPoint. Um, you can get it on the Fiveable website. When you look underneath where it shows the cast, it will say there's one resource. You can download it there. Um, but without further ado, let's move on. So Italian Renaissance art, uh, it is often focusing on the individual. Um, if you look at the example down here, Da Vinci's The Last Supper, um, this is a highly detailed example of the human form and the perfection that we want to see within the human form. The detail in the faces here is so amazing. Each one of these men has different faces. That is very radical from medieval art. Medieval art did not have different faces. They were almost always the same, okay? They were almost always identical uh, in what they would show an expression. And so with Renaissance art, that was new with that detail to the face uh, and to the body as well. Because the, again, they're showing these ideals of humanism, secularism, and individualism. And how do we do that? Well, we show the perfect human, the perfect body, the perfect smile, the perfect eyes, all of these things that could show us what we can be if we just work hard enough to it. Uh, with this picture right here, your eyes should automatically be drawn to Christ in the center. Um, and that is because of the perspective of depth in the, in the painting, as well as the placement of the bodies of the apostles in the foreground. Uh, this gives it a whole new mode of understanding that we would not have had in medieval art. Because in medieval art, everybody would have looked like they were just on top of each other because there was no depth perception. There was no placement in foreground, midground, and background. And then also the proportionality here. Um, Christ in the center is proportional in size to the apostles that are on the edge and the apostles that are closer to him. Uh, that proportionality also gives us the understanding of the scenery in the background. I can see the mountains or the hills behind them through the windows and of whatever building they're in. I can understand, you know, the size of the table comparative to them that are sitting at the table. Those are all things that we did not ever see in medieval art. Now, with Northern Renaissance art, it's a little bit different. <clears throat> Northern Renaissance art focuses a lot more on daily life, what we would call mundane living. Okay, it focuses on what the average person does from their day-to-day -day life. Okay. There's also a lot of portraitures, uh, portraits, excuse me, that are coming out of uh, this time period. Now, that's not to say the Italian Renaissance didn't have portraits. It did, but it's not as known as the Northern Renaissance for the portraits because the Italian Renaissance is more known for these big frescoes and their great sculptures. The Northern Renaissance art is known for its minute detail. Italian Renaissance had detail, don't get me wrong, but the Northern Renaissance had detail to such a degree that you could look at a painting of daily village life. And if you were to take a magnifying glass and find that little kid that's playing in the background, it'll show you exactly what he's playing with. That is what we're talking about with minute detail to the aspects of the painting. That's what we're referring to when we are talking about the, you know, the attention to detail that they had in the North that they just didn't have in the South. <clears throat> So some of the masters here, uh, that should have been titled, I apologize. Um, we have Peter Bruegel the Elder, Albrecht Dürer, and Jan Van Eyck. Now, Peter Bruegel the Elder is a painter and a printmaker. That's a big thing that's different from North and South. The North really focused on the use of the printing press here, printmaking, wood cutting. That's a massive thing here because that means that we can make these great pieces that are masterworks but you and I, who are the average people, can have a piece of it. We can own a copy of it. I'm 
probably never going to get to own a Leonardo da Vinci because, you know, I'm not rich, famous, or anything thereof. I can only see it in a museum. But I can get a copy of Peter Bruegel's cut woodcutting if I was alive in that time, and I didn't have to be rich and famous because of the printing press. In the previous stream, when we talked about, you know, the Northern Renaissance in general, the printing press, we said it couldn't be overstated. This is proof right here. We cannot overstate the printing press and how important it is to the Renaissance, especially the Northern Renaissance. Uh, Peter Bruegel, he is known for mostly his paintings of peasant life and landscapes. Um, his beautiful peasant life paintings show a lot of detail into what an everyday life would be like for someone living in a village in what is known as Flanders or the Low Countries. Um, today is Belgium and the Netherlands. Albrecht Dürer is from the Holy Roman Emperor Empire. Excuse me. He is German. Um, he is a painter. He's a printmaker. He's also a mathematician. So he does kind of fit that idea of this Renaissance man, a guy who can do art and science and math and language and all of the things therein. Um, he is most well known for his portraits, especially of himself, as well as his woodcuts. Um, his math focused a lot on geometry, um, and it's beyond my understanding because I'm not a math teacher. But he did write two books about mathematics. And then we have Jan van Eyck, who is a painter, probably the earliest painter of the Northern Renaissance. And for many, you could say that he might be... Um, a little earlier than what we would typically say is the Northern Renaissance. Uh, because of the fact that he was born in the 1300s, he dies in 1446, I think is when it is. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, I don't remember exactly. Um, but that, you know, the fact that he comes so early, it kind of highlights the idea of periodization and that it's not as black and white as we would like it to be, okay? So just remember that uh, you know these time periods bleed into each other: Italian Renaissance, Northern Renaissance, you know the medieval time period. Russia, for a lot of intents and purposes, we can say is stuck in the medieval time period until the late 1800s. It, it's arguments can be made for how we periodize again, if that's a word, history, and just remember that it all bleeds in together. Okay. Uh, so with that, um, let us continue. So this is Peter Bruegel, the Elder. Um, start here in the center with this is a woodcut. Now, woodcut uh, is exactly what it sounds like. You take a piece of wood, you cut the details into it. What you then do, you put ink on top of it, press paper down onto it, and it makes a copy of it. So the initial woodcut would probably have remained with him. And then after that, there have been copies after copies after copies made to make and spread the art that he created. Now, these are a little smaller because I wanted to fit them on the screen, but you can look them up. This is the seven deadly sins or the seven vices, uh, specifically anger. The detail that he included in wood, no less, which is amazing because there's not laser cutters. There's none of these you know, electronic tools that we use today to cut things into wood is fantastic. Uh, I especially like down here where it looks like, to me, kind of like a Tin Man guy from the Wizard of Oz. Uh, and he's like kind of trying to not get stabbed by this feature over there. Uh, you've got two people in what looks to be like a copper pot kind of huddling together. Uh, and you can see the fear on their faces. That's the thing here is that there's so much attention to detail. The emotion that's here is fantastic. Uh, and it's what really sets him apart. Uh, over here, this is one of his paintings. Uh, it's called Netherlandish Proverbs. Uh, again, guys, remember the Netherlands, technically it did not exist yet. Um, it was part of Spain. Uh, so what we actually have are the low countries or you might hear them refer to as Spanish Netherlands. Uh, but they still technically weren't around yet. Uh, this one is uh, one of my favorites of the Northern Renaissance oil paintings uh, because it's so outlandish. Like all of these things we're expected to believe happens every single day in daily life in a little village. It might, I don't know. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying it didn't, but there's just so much going on here. And that's what we're talking about with that minute detail. 
what he's showing us probably is everything that happens throughout the day. And he's just put it all into one painting. If you've ever been to uh, the Vatican and you've been into the Sistine Chapel and you look up, you've got these huge figures up there, right? And they're, you've got a lot of people, but it's so big that you don't have to worry about the, the tiny details because they're always there, right? But with this, this is a painting that's probably no bigger than what's behind my head right here, okay? And he's got all of that detail in there. That's absolutely amazing. I, it blows my mind that somebody has that amount of talent uh, back then to even think about doing it. I'd like to point out here the use of blue, okay? Um, and I said this in the Italian art uh, cast as well. Blue and purple are incredibly expensive colors. Um, because when we talk about those colors, there's very, very few sources that naturally create those colors uh, in nature. Okay, if you think about a blueberry, right? We call them blueberries, but in reality, what color are they really? Kind of like a purplish, okay? When you smash them up, okay? When you think about green, green is a little easier um, when you have leaves and plants that can make green. But when you think about uh, how green is made in like fabric, it's made using yellow and blue because it's very hard to find a natural green. A second, my computer is about to die, and I've got to find a place to plug it in. Hold on one second, guys. I apologize. Ugh. Hold on, guys. I'm almost there. Sorry. It's not one thing, it's another. All right. Sorry about that. It's life, right? Things happen. We adjust. And we are charging. Good. Okay. So I won't all of a sudden just disappear. Sorry about that. So let us continue on. Uh, so as I was saying about blue and green and purple, those are very expensive colors to make. Um, which if you look at the painting right here on the left, there's a lot of blue in there. It means this is a very expensive painting to make. Very, very expensive to recreate in that time frame. Um, and he used oil paint. Now oil painting, um, from my understanding, is it takes years, decades to dry, sometimes hundreds of years to dry. Uh, and so he's using a color that is very expensive to make. He's using a paint that takes forever to dry He's got a lot of faith in humanity. Um, I would hate to have been around if you know somebody had actually touched one of his paintings and messed it up. Uh, because he has a son who's also a painter, Peter Bruegel the Younger, uh, and they're uh, not the best of friends from my understanding. So I'm imagining there was probably some issues there with you know, Peter Bruegel the Younger touching things. I know I certainly would have. I digress. So if we look here on the right, this is a landscape painting that he did um of my favorite time period at least i'd love the winter time period um did oil paint start in the netherlands i don't actually know madonna um i can look that up for you that's a good question i don't think they did um i think they were used in the italian renaissance as well uh it's just that they're more well known for the northern renaissance the italian renaissance used frescoes just painting on plaster wet plaster um but I am not sure. I am looking it up for you because that is a good question. Did they start in the Netherlands? Um, no. It doesn't seem like it. No, it seems like oil painting has been around um, quite a long time. Apparently the Mona Lisa was painted in oil paint, um, which I did not know, but we also have oil painting used in Buddhist paintings in Afghanistan. So it's been around for a long time. It just didn't really gain popularity in Europe until the 15th century. From what a really quick Google search um, showed me. <laughs> so, but this painting of winter, this landscape, this is what we're talking about was the difference between Northern and Renna Northern Renaissance art and Italian Renaissance. He's showing the detail of land of nature which they did in the italian renaissance but they didn't focus on it 
they focused on the person, they focused on the individuality, on the human. So I would say that's why we kind of separate them into two styles of art. Uh, for me, I like the reason why I like the Northern Renaissance art more is simply because I do like that they focus so much on the detail of everything, not just of the human, uh, which is unique to the Northern Renaissance. Now, Albrecht Dürer is the next master that we have from the Renaissance in the North. And when I was younger, I remember seeing this painting here in the center. This was his self portrait at the age of 28 painted in 1500, right? And I remember the first time I saw it, I didn't know what it was. I was like, oh, it's Jesus. And then I come to find out from my teacher uh, when I was in college that a lot of the Western images that we have today of Christ, um, when you see him in artwork, so post 1500, draw upon Durer's self-portrait. Uh, according to my professor when I was in college, the reason for that was, was because Durer was so, trying to paint himself as Christ um, and of how he believed he would have looked like if he was in the time of Christ. Whether any of that's true or not, I mean, it's a college professor, they can tell you what they want, right? Um, but I do like to point out that, again, the minute detail here, look at that hair. Okay, the, the waviness of the individual strands of hair there is fantastic. Uh, it, it gives you a real sense of what his hair would have felt like, not just looked like, okay? On the left here, we've got an ink and paper drawing that was done by him that's praying hands. And again, that minute detail cannot highlight enough, the minute detail that is used by the Northern Renaissance artists. He has got the little cracks that we have in our knuckles here. Um, he's got the veins that are popping out on the hands, the, you know, the different lines that you have from the side perspective. It's so, uh, so much attention to detail that with the Italian Renaissance, they would have focused on the whole body. They wouldn't have really just focused on the hands. Okay, but Albert Dürer really wanted to focus on what it would have looked like for prayer. Okay, and this ties into Northern Renaissance ideals of Christian humanism, right? We're making ourselves better, but we're making ourselves better through Christ. We're showing how great we are and how perfect we can be, but showing that through Christ, okay, and through the Christian church. Uh, Albert Dürer was probably one of the most well-known portraitists of this time because he painted himself so much. Uh, he painted himself at different ages, which is really great because we get to see how he ages. And more importantly, we get to see how he sees himself. Okay, think about, you know, how do you view yourself? And then trying to describe it and somebody's drawing it. Are they really drawing what you see or are they drawing their interpretation of what you see? Here, we see what he sees. There's no interpretation of it. It's him and only him. And that's fantastic. Uh, just like Peter Bruegel, the elder, he was also a woodcutter. And so you have his Adam and Eve here done in 1504. Uh, again, the detail, her hair, the flowiness of it, the leaves uh, that you have this bird on and on the trees. You've got the snake here um, that's representative of the devil and she's holding the apple. All of these things would have been carved into wood and then ink put on top paper pressed down, and copies made out. Uh, that's just not something we saw in the Italian Renaissance. They weren't known for their printmaking like that. Uh, I don't think it's that they didn't do it, it just wasn't very common as much as it was in the North. But again, that goes back to the fact that the North didn't have as much money, right? Because notice that his painting here, browns, it's different shades of brown and black with ink, okay? things that are cheaper than bright colors, like the blues and the reds and the purples and the greens, uh, which the Italians could have afforded to use in their paint. So that's probably one reason why a lot of people also say that it looks so dark, right? The, it always looks like they're always in you know, some sort of fog or you know, life isn't really that good. It's not that it's not good, it's just they didn't have as much money. And so they had to show it in what it was. And they did that with what they had. And when they had that, you know, that was through browns and, you know, natural colors. 
Uh, my favorite, though, is Jan Van Eck. Okay, and I love Jan Van Eck um, for a couple of reasons. One, for the fact that he just doesn't fit the time frame that we always talk about with the Northern Renaissance. Uh, he's so much earlier than the time frame that people kind of forget that he is a Renaissance painter because he's not using the medieval style. Okay. Uh, we're going to do the middle one last, the Arnolfini portrait. We're going to start up here in the top right with the Dresden Trippich. Now, what that means is that these three panels right here, these are on wood, and they are hung together, and they make the entire scene. Okay, so you've got Mary, you have Christ, you have an angel. I think it's Gabriel. It might be Michael. Please don't quote me on that. Um, you have royalty, and then you have a monk. Uh, Jan van Eyck was most known for his portraits and for his Madonnas. Uh, not you, Madonna, or the singer, sorry, but Madonna refers to the Virgin Mary. Um, he painted a lot of different versions of the Madonna. Um, we've got two of them here. You got the one in the Trippich on the left, uh, and then you have the one on the right. Uh, when we talk about his painting of the Madonna, he always painted her with different expressions. He always painted her with different hair, different styles, always paying attention to that detail, that minute detail, right? On the right-hand side, uh, what I love to point out is up here on the right, on the top, you've got him painting a stained glass window. And he's got the lines that would be in a stained glass window. I don't have the patience to even think of what it would have been like to paint that. And here he is painting, it's a massive piece, okay? It's very, very big. It would have hung almost from the ceiling all the way down probably to my mid-back, if not longer, right? And he's painting these lines on a stained glass window and on the detail of the stuff coming out of the window, the light sunbeams coming out of the window. Okay, you've got a bird here, representative piece, the colors of the angel's wings. Absolutely amazing. It's mind blowing. Uh, but my favorite is and always will be the Arnolfini portrait, okay? Um, because of the fact of the color of her dress and the misunderstanding that's commonly held with this painting, okay? Arnolfini was uh, a real people. They were actually, you know, traders that lived in the Netherlands. Um, obviously, by the name, you could tell they are Italian. Uh, but a lot of people misunderstand this is that they are a husband and wife who are being painted before the birth of their child. That's not what it is, actually. If you look here, what she's holding is the cloth of the dress that she has. Because, and this is the beginnings of the birth of the middle class, the beginnings of having expendable wealth, okay? She has so much money that she can afford to have a lot of cloth in what she's wearing. Okay, now at this time frame, this area of the world is known for its wool um, and for having the softest wool in the world. And so she's wearing a very expensive, expensive piece of clothing. Um, for you and me, we're talking like it could be an entire year's salary worth. Okay, because again, green, very expensive color to make. Blue, very expensive color to make. Um, and actually, another reason I love this painting um, is because there is a YouTube series about the history of fashion. Um, and she does an entire episode on this dress and this painting. I'm going to find that video and I will upload it to the uh, Fiveable um, resources. It's about a 30 minute long uh, video. And it's just absolutely great because you get to see why this painting was so revolutionary for the time, as well as why it shows the wealth of the time. The other thing that we have here um, in which I think is a great example of that minute attention to detail. On the bottom left, you have the uh, mirror that's behind the two people in the Arnolfini portrait. And it is showing you what they would look like from behind. And you can see people that would be standing in front of them. How amazing is that? Like he thought of everything to put in this painting, put in the reflections, put in the other people that would have been there, 
who is the painter, by the way. So he's painting himself, right? Uh, he, the colors that he uses, the, the show of wealth, okay? Um, I'm still searching for that uh, dress now because I really want you guys to see it. It's such a great episode. It's called A Stitch in Time. There we go. A Stitch in Time. I will post that video um, for you guys when we're done, but I wanted to remind myself uh, for it. So Jan van Eyck, um, born in the 1300s, dies in the mid 1400s. So technically we would say before uh, the Renaissance, before the Italian Renaissance, but he is part of the Northern Renaissance by many historians and art historians viewpoint because he's not using medieval style, which was what was very common at the time. He's not using Italian style, which was just developing. He's using the distinct Northern style of minute detail, the daily life, right? And the attention to landscapes and animals and things like that. Uh, absolutely amazing. I just love this patient, the Arnolfini portrait. So when we compare uh, Italian versus Northern art styles, the Italian Renaissance, its subject matter usually came from Greek and Roman myths. Um, so you have, uh, Bertoli's Birth of Venus is an example. It is Bertoli. Um, as one, uh, you've got the religious themes. Obviously, there's a lot of Davids. There's a lot of Madonnas. Um, you've got Holofernes, uh, Judith and Holofernes is an example. Um, but it's still very much going to be drawing from what's around them. And they had a lot of history there. It's not that the North didn't have a lot of history. It's just that the North didn't have the access the Roman and Greek history like the Italians did. So if we look at what the North is gonna take, well, they've got domestic life. That's what they've campaigned. They've got, you know, the countryside. They've got people who can paint portraits. Um, and of course they have religious themes just like the Italian art. So there's some similarities there. Um, Italian art is definitely known for its perspective, its use of symmetry. Um, we have something that's called contraposto or counterpose. Uh, you can divide the body in two, and one side is going to be... <laughs> Excuse me, now it finally sneezed, finally came out. Uh, so one side, um, contraposto, would be, you know, maybe an arm bent and a leg bent, and on the other side, the arm and the leg would be straight. Uh, while in Northern Renaissance art, it's more natural. It's going to be more naturalistic style, more naturalistic poses. Uh, it's going to focus more on what you're naturally going to, you know, do or look like. Uh, in Italian Renaissance art, they're known for that anatomical correctness, uh, which they did get away from, from medieval art. Uh, but we're talking like the detail of, you know, where the ribs would be, where you would have the six or eight pack, the muscle definition in arms and in legs. Um, and it looks real. If you look at Michelangelo's David, where he's about to, you know, He's got the sling on his shoulder and it looks like he's about to fling it. You can just imagine him actually going through the action and doing it. While in Northern art, it's that minute surface detail. You know, the little kid playing with the dog, the mom yelling out the window, you know, the baker putting the bread in the window, things like that. It's that minute detail that really make up the difference. For the medium, when we talk about medium, we're saying how did they paint or how did they create art? Uh, for the Italian Renaissance, uh, they had frescoes. Now, fresco is where you have wet plaster, you paint on top of it, and you let it dry. Okay, so Da Vinci's The Last Supper is a fresco. Uh, tempura paint, oil paint, um, they also used a lot of bronze and marble, which is very unique to the Italian um, styles. The Northern Renaissance didn't really use a lot of metal working or uh, sculpting through marble uh, because it would have been way too expensive to get the materials uh, because it's not naturally occurring up there. Uh, so what they used is oil um, on panel. Panel usually means wood uh, instead of canvas. And they also used block printing where they would cut the picture into the wood, the wood print, and then they would print it using um, the uh, ink from the printing press. And one of my animals has decided he wants to come say hi, because I have been up here for an hour and a half now. So this is Roku. He will join us for the rest of the cast. Um, but Northern Renaissance art, it's 
to me, I love it so much more than I love uh, Italian Renaissance art. I, I just cannot say enough about you know, how that minute detail affects your view of what they actually did. So that's about what I was gonna cover. Um, what kind of questions do you have about Northern Renaissance art that I can answer? And while you do that, I'm gonna bring up a poll for you. I'd love to know, what do you learn? So which do you like better? Do you like Italian Renaissance art or Northern Renaissance art? This is Roku, by the way. He usually jumps up here much earlier, and I'm kind of glad he didn't. But yeah, he normally joins me in almost all of my casts. How would I explain social reform in Northern art? Very good question. So let's go back and go back to Peter Bruegel the Elder. And so I would look at it through his paintings on village life and to look at social reform. Um, you kind of can look at, you know, the earlier paintings and village life, very poor, very, you know, very mundane tasks. You have farmers, you have animals. People are kind of doing the same thing every single day. As the use of the printing press spread literacy and education, you'll start to see a change in the daily life, bringing in of wealth, okay? Because now people can come up with new ideas, they can come up with new inventions. Um, you'll also see the beginnings of that social change from the Reformation um, with battles between Catholics and Protestants um, or religious arguments between you know, Lutheran and uh, Catholic priests, things like that would have been painted by the Northern Renaissance artists. How important were the Hanseatic League merchants as patrons of art in the North? You know, the Hanseatic League was important for kind of setting the economy of the North, and they were patrons, but they weren't as important as the kings and the queens were for Northern Renaissance artists. Those were the big patrons of art. Um, because they're consolidating power, right? And how do we show power? We show power through our use of money. Well, if I'm ridiculously rich, I can spend money on this garden that you, uh, my subject, are going to enjoy, and I'm going to have, uh, you know, different uses of, you know, plants, and I'm trying to explain this better than it's coming out. Um, but also just the way that the portraits, because that's the big thing, portraits, okay? How a king and a queen would be shown in a portrait would never show anything other than the best of that king or the queen. They would never show any kind of aging or disease or any malformity of the king or the queen. Um, but if you go and look at some of the paintings of the Spanish kings from the 1600s to the 1700s, they really should have stopped marrying cousins because you can't hide those kinds of deformities in paint. They kind of get exacerbated in paint, right? Um, I would say that kings and queens are way more important as patrons than the Hanseatic League. In Germany, it would be the individual princes of the uh, Holy Roman Empire that are the major paint, uh, paintings. Hans Holbein considered Northern Renaissance. Yes, Hans Holbein was considered Northern Renaissance um, he is definitely one of those that you may see on the test. I would say you definitely see Jan van Eck more than you would see Hans Holbein. Um, now, when we talk about Hans Holbein, uh, definitely the younger, because there's Hans Holbein the older and Hans Holbein the younger, is going to be more likely what we're going to know as um, the Northern Renaissance, because Hans Holbein the elder he was a Gothic style, and Gothic was distinctly medieval. Um, but that does bring up a good point. Uh, in the Italian Renaissance, they completely rejected the Gothic style and the Romanesque style that we saw develop in the medieval time period. 
in the north, they didn't completely abandon it. They married it with the Renaissance development of perspective, of detail, of humans and focusing on the individuality there. Um, so we don't completely lose Gothic um, developments in Northern Renaissance, um, but it has changed its focus uh, from being solely on God to that mundane everyday person. So yes, and answer your initial question, Hans Holbein the Younger, Northern Renaissance, Hans Holbein the Elder, Gothic, Medieval. Uh, but we don't abandon Gothic. We just kind of reform Gothic. What other questions? You guys have made my cat very happy because I'm sitting here and he's getting attention. <laughs> If you guys don't have any other questions, uh, what I will do is I will get that video, um, A Stitch in Time, um, the Arnolfini painting up on the Fiveable uh, website. If you have the time, go on to YouTube and there's an entire series. Um, she does, I think, eight of them. Uh, they're about a half an hour each. Uh, and what she does is she goes through paintings that were done at different time periods. Um, so she starts with the Arnolfini painting um, because that's kind of what we, you know, think of as the Northern Renaissance, start of the Renaissance. Um, then she does a painting about Charles II um, and a painting of Marie Antoinette. Um, and there's a couple others I can't remember right now. But what makes them so cool is that through the recreation of the clothing in the painting, she explains why the painting would display what it displays how expensive it would show the cloth that's being used um, and why, you know, an artist or a person would want this particular garment immortalized in paint. It's just such a cool thing to watch because you really don't think of like fashion and history as being something that go together. And she puts it together so beautifully. It's really cool. Uh, I don't, does the Northern Renaissance find a foothold in Sweden and Norway? Yes, it does. The Northern Renaissance finds a foothold in Poland, too. Um, and I always used to make fun of Poland with my students. I'm sorry if you're Polish. Um, because Poland always gets a bad rap, right? It's like, oh, we're a country, and now we're taken over by the Germans. Oh, we're a country, and now we're taken over by the Austrians. Oh, we're a country, and then the Russians. And it's like they never get their you know, time. They never get their due. Uh, but the Northern Renaissance, it makes its way to Poland. It makes its way to Sweden, to Denmark, and to Norway. I would say the reason why you probably don't see it as much talked about from there is because by the time it's made its way there, the Reformation becomes the focus of life for those people, um, as well as uh, the events that are going on at that time. You have the Thirty Years' War, you know, the German Peasants' War. You you've got too much else going on for the sole focus to be on art any longer and on, you know, Christian humanism and society. Now it's on survival. It's on, you know, your soul. And are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? You know, do you believe as I believe? Do you not believe as I believe? Can we get along these types of issues? So it does get gain a foothold in Sweden, in Norway, um, in Denmark and Poland. Uh, it's just that it's, overshadowed by other events. Um, any other questions? You are absolutely welcome. Uh, I'm glad you guys can make it. Uh, thank you for being ooh, so attentive. My cat just touched something. Um, and I hope you guys will join me next Saturday uh, and join Stephen Kuklik on Tuesday and Liam Machlin on Thursday. Uh, Roku and myself, we say kia kaha. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you next time. Bye.